future. Make the world a better place. Hyperloop's a fifth mode of transport. We're building a full length tube between any two destinations and then we'll send things really, really fast through that. Hyperloop's gonna allow people to travel from Los Angeles to San Francisco in 30 minutes. Our target pod speed is around 750 miles per hour. This is a reality, and it's not in some large timeline. We build things faster than any other team does in the world. So we're talking about having full-scale test loops. The reality is here in downtown Los Angeles. All right. All right, cool. So how many of you heard of the Hyperloop before? Or, or want, to take, want to take a ride on one as soon as the, uh, the first tube is built? Yeah, right? So, um, um, it's real. I mean, that was the headline of the cover story in Forbes, uh, the Hyperloop is real. Um, Elon Musk put out a white paper, I think it was four years, three years ago maybe, and he called it a, 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 a if a rail gun and an air hockey table and the Concorde had a three-way, this is what it would be. But it, it literally could change the world. So with me is Rob Lloyd here, and Shervin Pishavar, to his right, founder, CEO. So um, Rob, I'll start with you. So, what is the Hyperloop that you're doing? How different is it from what Elon envisioned? And take us through like the, the present and then the future. Sure. So the basic architecture is very simple, very elegant, and it actually works. And the team that Brogan Bam Brogan, our founder that studied at the University of Elon Musk for a decade, one of the t first 25 employees there, is innovating around that basic construct, that we can reduce the pressure in a controlled environment, we can use levitation technologies to reduce the friction from wheels, we can create an electric motor that moves something very quickly, and in that environment we can create speeds we've never thought about possible. All that is happening right now, and we're buying steel and we're buying tube, and we're actually producing the technology that will make this a reality. So. Uh, it's a business of builders mm -hmm. and a team of 70, and uh, the progress has been astounding. So it was a little bit of a career change for you, because I don't know if you people know, but you were a top guy at Cisco, number one or two, and now you're doing this. This is a very different world. What, why would you, why'd you make the switch? I mean, how could you possibly apply those skills? Not that they're non-admirable skills, but those skills to this exciting adventure. Yeah, so I felt uh, when I met Shervin and uh, heard of the opportunity, we had a very fortuitous intersection. Um, I thought the patterns that I'd recognized as the internet developed over 20 years of the backbone expanding as we saw new access technologies and every time there was a major iteration, we needed a new backbone. And I thought, wait a minute, we are seeing driverless cars and on-demand economy evolve. And the fundamental backbone of the transportation infrastructure we have today is based on century-old technology. So it felt like there was an opportunity, meeting Brogan and the team, seeing the board of directors that Shervin had assembled behind this project, and the initial capitalization, it was like, this is gonna happen, mm -hmm. and I just have to go there. So it's been great. Yes. So Shervin, walk us through the formation of the company, like why you did it, uh, and how, it, how you put it together, because it's a pretty interesting story. Sure, absolutely. Um, it was in conversations with, with my friend Elon Musk uh, before he had published his, his white paper, and in those conversations I realized the, the absolute importance of making Hyperloop a reality as fast as possible. Uh, much of our world is held back by infrastructure that has been uh, planted in the ground from the 20th century and it's degrading and falling apart. And so the world is moving slower and slower as we should be moving faster and faster. And so I made a commitment there and then to try to do everything I can to assemble the greatest minds in the world and was very lucky to meet uh, my co-founder, uh, Brogan Van Brogan, who was at SpaceX before for almost 10 years mm -hmm. and helping uh, Elon and his mission to, to reach Mars. And Every top engineer there kept saying Cabro, which was his nickname at the time. He's, he's the guy who can actually build this. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the most talented engineers I've ever met. Um, and one of the unique things about him is that he wants to show you things. He doesn't care about something on, 
on a design board or a whiteboard unless it's something he, he can actually build in real time. And now he's built a team of 70 people uh, at our headquarters, our three-acre campus in downtown Los Angeles. Um, so from inception of the idea to now, we've assembled some incredible people. And Rob Lloyd joining as, as CEO in the last month and a half is, a, is an incredible milestone for us. And all the more, uh, you know, meaningful for me that we're here in Dublin uh, because uh, Dublin actually has played a big role in, in my own career. Uh, it signed the, the Uber term sheet here uh, three years ago mm -hmm. at the Shelburne Hotel uh, when, when Uber was only about 9,000 employees and walked the streets of uh, Dublin with Travis, had a pint, and uh, is when he told me his vision for changing transportation in that, in that way. Mm -hmm. And then last year, uh, we actually closed the Hyperloop Series A term sheet at the Shelbourne Hotel again. So I thank Ireland for the luck of the Irish. <laughs> um, and now we have some important news to break here as well in Dublin again. Sure. So uh, when I joined Hyperloop, Shervin said, now we've got to get the capital required to do this project. We we have a clear focus as a company to build that three-kilometer uh, three test loop by the end of 2016. It takes money, it takes equipment, it takes people. So we're very pleased that on our road to the $80 million raise that we're under right now, that we're, we've actually closed 26 million of that. We issued a convertible note. We attracted some phenomenal investors from around the world and lead venture capitalists like Kosla that have come in on that initial mm -hmm. round. And I like to just say I'm pretty confident based on the interest we've seen around the world, we'll close that full 80 by, by the end of this calendar year, giving Brogan and team the opportunity to buy everything they need and every piece of equipment and every pound of steel required to achieve our Kitty Hawk moment one year later. So that's amazing progress yeah. and uh, we're pretty excited. Absolutely. So how much, how, yeah, there you go. You let, the, let the moment happen. So, uh, so what's next? So what are the key technical challenges that have to happen? Because I don't know if people have read the paper, but there's a tremendous speed. There's a vacuum tube. It's miles of steel. There's a, 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 a pod going hundreds of miles an hour on a little cushion of air. So a lot of this, none of this stuff has is, is really been done before. So, yeah, so we can build it today. Uh, we can build everything about Hyperloop today. But in order to achieve the cost efficiencies that we need to achieve to, to really make it as disruptive as we believe it will be, we need to do some innovations. We'll do innovation in tube uh, material. It'll be steel, but we can innovate across that uh, construction. We'll be building systems to manufacture in situ, so we're not moving big pipes around, but just actually manufacturing in location. We're, doing, we're developing our own linear synchronous drive motor that will propel uh, the, uh, the pod designing pods for both freight and cargo, looking at tunneling technologies so we can get right-of-way access in high-density environments. And we've even hired some very, very expert people that are helping us imagine how the tube itself would be underwater so we can cross across the oceans. And um, when you do that, you start changing everything. So the, the, those elements of technology, uh, the propulsion, uh, the levitation, uh, the pod design and the tube design and manufacturing are the key innovations where we're registering IP. We'll put them all together as a system and actually achieve the test at 700 plus miles an hour over three kilometers uh, by the end of the year. End of next year? 2016. End of 2016. Wow. Well, where is it going to be? Is it going to be in the desert somewhere? Uh, we're just or? finalizing the location. We'll find a place with pre-permits so we don't have to, to wait. And we've ordered the steel, so we need to fill in the purchase order with the ship to address pretty quickly. It's a lot of steel. That's cool. And where do you think the first track is going to, the first Hyperloop is going to be? I mean, I, I can imagine it's not going to be in the United States where there's so much NIMBY and dense buildings. And I would think it's somewhere like in Brazil or China where, where there's either space or the political oomph right. to push it through. So I've been astounded by the interest and in, in, in Brogan and I are actually leaving here and he's going in one direction, I'm going another. There are projects around the world that are looking at what they've been trying to do to build infrastructure for economic advantage. There are parts of this planet that believe that infrastructure is a capability that drives uh, GDP and 
and value. We think the disruptive nature of creating an on-demand infrastructure where you don't imagine that we set up big trains but we only move a pod when it's required. We transform how we think of real estate development and how we think of ports. Uh, I actually think the interest is inbound. It's very global in nature right now. And my gut tells me we'll be seeing interest uh, that will probably enable us to pick those first three projects that demonstrate the disruptive nature of this technology uh, starting in 2017. And we'll have three projects underway uh, and close to completion by 2020. Wow. So, Shervin, so, um, you've thought a little bit more about how this could change the way we live and where we live. Rob was just alluding to it. Can you walk us through, like, uh, physically what would happen? Like, what kind of people would this appeal to? Who would be using it? Is it going to be expensive? Is it like a $5 trip? Is it a $1,000 trip? Or what do you think? Is sure. gonna, how's it going to play out? Well, I'll start with the, the, the implications on our global economy. At the top level, Hyperloop will make the world a village again. Um, it will compress space and time. It won't matter where we actually live and work anymore. You'll be able to commute distances of three, 400 miles per hour or more a day in you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, and so your daily commute that you spend in traffic uh, currently today, wasting time and polluting the, the, the planet, all of those things begin to ease away. One of the things that we also see is that uh, it makes the world a greener place. Uh, because we're doing cargo as well as, as people transport, one of the things we realized, and this was a shocking fact that most people don't know, the top 15 largest cargo ships in the world pollute the world more than all the cars combined. More than a billion cars, 15 ships. That just can't stand anymore. We need to protect our planet and Hyperloop will be begin to build a completely new transportation grid that can move atoms as fast as, as, as we've moved bits and move people and things around the world and route them efficiently. And those are the great benefits. In terms of the global economy, we begin to introduce the idea of manufacturing and delivery in real time, as Rob talked about in, in the on-demand economy, which at Sherpa Capital, that's one of our founding areas of investment. The reason that's important is that we can actually deliver things at the speed of thought. So you're able to actually order something and then have it manufactured, distributed, and delivered all within a 24 to 72 hour period of time. What that does is it gets rid of all those warehouses with depreciating assets, uh, wasting away. It takes inventory financing and compresses it from 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, which is a tax on the global economy, and it compresses it into 24 hours, 72 hours, periods of time. And those, have, those things have massive implications. The other aspect is you look at places that are dark today in terms of infrastructure, um, and you use the analogy of Africa skipping ahead from telecom, fixed line telecom to mobile and the impact that that's had on, Af on African economies. And you say, well, now we skip ahead of all of these old infrastructures of the 20th century, and we connect the world in places like Africa and other places that are not connected to the rest of the world uh, in a way and in a speed that's never been done before. And Bruce, what about real estate? Um, you know, we, d we define the value of real estate by how close it is to where people live, but we can create new cities 150 miles away from the, a city center, and you could be there faster than you could drive today by being in the city center. So we can redefine how cities are, are architected. We can redefine how runways and airports are connected as kind of terminals rather than distinct airports. We can transform ports, which sit on some of the world's most valuable land, and maybe move the container offloading offshore and create an, an, an inshore uh, an inland port where the mm -hmm. intermodal connections happen, 50 to 100 miles inland that bypasses a city and, get, and gets trucks off uh, our, our urban streets. So the opportunity to change so many things is almost endless. And that's why I think it's such a big, big idea. But is it, is it a play for the elites only? I mean, when I, talk, when I hear about new cities being built farther away, I think about people getting away, who, people who have means to get away leaving, for, you know, abandoning crumbling Well, if you were cities. in San Francisco right now, you'd probably find it's very difficult to find 
a great place to live close to work, and I was just talking to a former colleague who used to commute two hours to get from the North Bay to the South Bay, and that's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. That is crazy. So why not find new areas we can get to very directly, and if we have to cross under some water or create a tunnel in an urban area, that's the kind of solutions that I think are going to change how we define cities, how we create manufacturing facilities, and uh, there'll be a product family of Hyperloop technology that fits each of those use cases. Well, one of the things we found in, in technology and innovation is that we call this uh, uh, capacity utilization. So if you can more efficiently utilize the assets that, that exist, Uber did this with, with black cars and then uh, expanded from there, there from UberX. Black cars subsidize UberX and then UberPool, et cetera. And, in the, and with UberPool, you suddenly have transportation options that are as cheap as a bus ride. And so all of these things, when you look at Hyperloop, cargo subs subsidizes people transport. So at the, at the people level, it'll be extremely affordable to be able to trans use this, mm -hmm. this kind of transportation option. Or it's competing with non-use, you know, someone who's, who never got a chance to go <coughs> to California can go, because right. like, like, kind of like blah blah car, where it's competing right. with trains or people who, who didn't want to go to a city 200 miles away. Right. And it's on demand, we don't need to build a shopping center to, to occupy our time when we're at the airport. Uh, we're not really at the airport to shop, that's because it's not on demand and it's interrupted and it's, it's, it's an experience which most of us would rather was different. Right. So the terminal for Hyperloop is an entirely new construct. It's not a shopping plaza. It's a very efficient way for us to actually move, push the button, hit floor 23, and the door opens and you're in a different location. So who, who's the team? I mean, you, you're, a, you're a, a big hire from a different space, but with the bandwidth to, to take this on. What kind of people are coming on board? Where are they coming from? They're coming from everywhere, and, mm -hmm. and we're attracting talent. Clearly where we are in LA is at the hub of aeronautics and, and, and the SpaceX and the Northrop Grumman's and others. We're hiring people from GE. We're hiring people from Tesla. Uh, we are hiring brilliant, brilliant masters and PhDs who are laying down and taking their construct and building it uh, and, and drilling and, and building. Uh, it's phenomenal, and if you talk to a PhD, uh, that's actually able to take their ideas and then go and build and deliver. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a level of engineering which actually is a, helping us achieve that speed. So great talent from companies around the world and 70 totally awesome people today and we expect to be about 100 uh, by uh, the first quarter. Okay, so this all started with Elon and it's, that's kind of the big elephant in the room. It's like what's he gonna do? Is he gonna swing back into this, do something big? I know that his, some of his engineers at SpaceX are building uh, test track in Texas, I think. Uh, are, you, are you guys in touch with him? Is he I involved at all, or advising, or will he will he get more involved as time goes on? I think I think uh, Elon's greatest contribution was the the invention of the idea and contributing into the world. And his experiment was to say, um, I'm too busy with SpaceX and trying to get to Mars and Tesla and Solar City, uh, so I will contribute this idea to the world and hope that teams will assemble to bring it together. Mm -hmm. And so he's very supportive of these efforts, uh, and we're going full speed ahead on execution. Okay. Hey Bruce, I gave away ticket 1A this morning, and I wondered whether you would accept ticket 1B for our first Hyperloop journey. Are you in? Totally. All right, well, thank, thank you, you very yeah. much. Yeah. I do, I do want an exit row, though. Can I get, can I get an exit row? Uh, you can get an exit row. Okay. Yeah, but well, you already sent me a ticket. I have one on my desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, this is the real ticket. This is real ticket. Yeah, he's okay. got the real ticket. Now. All right. Yeah. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank Appreciate you very much. It.